Um, it's a real pleasure to um, introduce uh, Professor Andy Coburn, who uh, is uh, one of the academic staff in our department. He teaches human computer interaction, uh, but it's also his main research area, and in fact, he's quite well known around the world uh, for quite a few things that uh, he's done in human computer interaction. Oh, embarrassing. Uh, and worked for companies, or done work that has been picked up by companies like Microsoft. Am I allowed to tell? No. Okay. <laughs> Microsoft, yes, Logitech, yes. <laughs> Logitech, and a few other companies that you've heard of, but I can't tell you who they are. Um, and uh, but, but I'll, and uh, also uh, with uh, Joey and Philip, who are uh, doing PhDs in the department. Um, so this is a, a very specialised look at some particular things that people do with human computer interaction. Uh, but then I persuaded Andy to ha hang around afterwards and go through some stuff for one of the standards on, on that as well. So those of you who have heard me talk about it, um, you can see if he tells the same story, that would be really interesting to go. Uh, anyway, go for it. Thank you. Great, thanks a lot, Tim. Um, so what am I going to cover? Um, this is going to be a very fast introduction to human computer interaction research. Uh, I'm going to give you probably about 10 minutes worth of uh, preview of that, and then I'll switch over to the real guys, my PhD students, Philip, who will talk about making scrolling devices a lot better, uh, Joey, who will talk about making command-based <coughs> interfaces a lot better, and uh, then we'll come back to me on really human-computer interaction teaching. Uh, this is all quite, I suppose, ethereal from your point of view. This is the next generation of user interfaces. But this is how do you get the biggest bang for your buck in terms of improving interaction and improving understanding of interaction in the shortest amount of time. Because you don't have a lot of time to communicate this, these topics to your students. So how do you get the biggest effect in the shortest amount of time? So human-computer interaction research, this is my <coughs> stereotypical picture of it. One person using one computer. And you're probably sitting there thinking, well, computer science, how on earth do you fill a whole curriculum at university on computer science? This is a tiny topic, right? Um, well, I'm going to talk about one small part of computer science, and what I'm going to try to do is convince you that that one small part of computer science is so big that there's far too much for me as a researcher in this area to keep track of. It's an enormous field. My one small area is too big for 20 years worth of research. Uh, so computer science is a huge discipline. So what do people in human computer interaction actually do? Using computers, right? That can't be that, that big an area. Well, you can approach it as a technologist. So a lot of computer scientists, their fundamental interest is in the machine. That's what they're most interested in. So they develop new tools and techniques, research methodologies, programming languages, methods to help you build user interfaces more quickly and hopefully so that they're more usable by, by the people who have to sit in front of them all day. And other people are interested more in the hardware and coming up with new form factors, so flexible displays. And the technology and the hardware is really driving their primary interest. That's not so much what we do in our group. We're closer to the, the scene that sits between the user and the computer over here. So we investigate things like, as Phil will talk about in a minute, how to make these fundamental devices that we use to do all of our activities with computers, how do we make those operate more efficiently, be more satisfying, more engaging, uh, get your job done quicker. Other people, though, come up with interfaces like this. So they're interested in, well, look, humans have certain capabilities, certain senses, like they can see, they can hear, they can touch, and they can smell, right? So this is an olfactory interface. The Japanese are great at coming up with crazy new types of user interfaces. So here there's a camera that looks at virtual cookies, identifies what flavor the virtual cookie is supposed to be, and as you bring it up to your mouth, it injects into your, into your nose different sorts of scents. This, I love this. I saw this last year at the big international conference on human computer interaction. I thought it was fabulously daft. Is it this? This is for us, this. You can't, can't buy that one out here. Um, another interface I think that's a lot more practical is a short video from um, some colleagues in uh, Microsoft and Carnegie Mellon. I think this is a great... Oh, sorry, I forgot to plug in my audio. Oh, the audio cable's not long enough. <laughs> Sorry, I should 
And remember that this is just a small part of computer science. This field is enormous. So with that, I'll pass over to Joanne and Philip. I'm not sure who's going to go first. And we'll come back to me for teacher next year. Function that lets us do those two things. We can go quickly when we want to go quickly, and we don't lose much 
much, much, much precision at the low end. We can still scroll line by line when we want to. Uh, we ran an experiment where we tested this in a variety of different conditions. I won't go through the details, but just briefly I'll show you this, um, this heat to heat video we did between our band function on the left and traditional state of the art uh, on, on the right. Again, we're scrolling from the top to this target at the bottom. And it starts off in slow motion because it goes kind of quick. But on the left, you see three, two and a half quick flicks, and we're already incredibly close to the target. <laughs> and so, in the time it took for a traditional game to go you know, one, one length of this, we could do it three times over and without losing much precision and with far less effort. Um, and that's document length between its role. Thank you. I should point out that the University of Canterbury wants us to patent that. Uh, you're the first people to ever see it, and we've probably just negated our ability to patent <laughs> it by showing it to you. So, hot off the press. We can, we can stop the questions at uh, Joey's. Sub menus before finally finding the control you want is a performance bottleneck. 
Um, so you already know what the control you want is, but you have to waste time getting the interface into a state um, where the control is visible so you can click it. So on the face of it, it might seem that Microsoft's ribbon toolbar is a significant improvement over menus. Um, because with menu systems, you always had to open at least one menu before you found the command you wanted, but with the ribbon, one of the tabs is always visible. So if the command you want is on the currently selected tab, then it'll be faster, right? Um, so that may be true, but what happens when the command isn't on the currently selected tab? So since the participants in our first study were pretty good at guessing the locations of familiar controls, even when they couldn't see them, um, we hypothesized that there might be some kind of mobile <coughs> error effect where you know where an item is spatially, um, so you instantly look there, and then you realize that you're actually in the wrong tab. So you have to think about which tab you're supposed to be in, and then find it, and click it, and then you can click the command. For example, say you want word art. Um, if you've used word art a lot, you might know that it's uh, that here on the ribbon. So we think that a user's first instinct is to go straight to this location, rather than thinking about the tab first, uh, like this. That's a little bit exaggerated, but... <laughs> so we ran some mathematical performance models on this mental process, and it gave us the following graph. So when all the commands you want are in the current tab, the ribbon is faster than menus, um, but when all the commands you want are in different tabs, the ribbon is actually significant, significantly slower. So if you assume that 50% of the commands you need will be in the current tab, then it's very slightly faster, but we thought we could do a bit better than this. So we came up, came up with an interface which we called Command Maps. Um, so our prototype is pretty simple. It's just all of the ribbon tabs shown at once, like this. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> so the Command Map, it's displayed as an overlay when you pulse down control, so it doesn't interfere with your workspace. Um, but, so the design principles behind it are that, first of all, there's no, well, there's minimal or no hierarchy, which makes commands quick to access. Um, and all of the commands are spatially constant, and they have unique on-screen locations, which means that um, each portion of the screen uniquely maps to a single command, which means there's no mode error, uh, like in the ribbon. So a performance model shows that when you're familiar with commands, the command map should be much faster than ribbons and menus. Um, so performance is about the same as the ribbon when the command you want is in the current selected tab, um, but it doesn't deteriorate when it's not, since it doesn't have the notion of the current tab at all. So we did an experiment. Um, the performance models are all well and good, but in order to draw meaningful conclusions, you need hard empirical data. So we ran another experiment where we got 18 participants to sit down and do about 360 command selections using the three different interfaces. Um, and we were really happy to discover that the results completely validated our model, um, which isn't always the case with models. So that's good. Uh, you can see the graphs are almost identical. Um, and on average, command maps saved about 0.5 seconds compared to the standard ribbon performance. Um, so yeah, we published a paper on that showing the command maps are faster for expert users, and the ribbon causes mode errors, which can make it even slower than we use um, under some circumstances. So yeah, that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very 
just make the property just the ambulation, but when you had to design one that you class that, was it the actual the bus you worked on or was it a program within the class? No, so our, um, our stuff was, was all done in, in, in software and it's able to work across uh, which is across a couple of different common devices. So it's, it's flexible with regards to the, the device. Oh, right. It's actually a really good question and a very subtle one. Uh, so we, we just submitted this paper to the leading conference in the, in the field and we got feedback that was this, essentially the question you're asking and we haven't really properly thought about it in advance. So the device, the mouse, reports to the operating system a particular level of movement. And the operating system, or the device driver actually, uh, amplifies that signal itself and then reports that to the application like Microsoft Word or, or Adobe Reader. Okay? So we cannot control the amplification that happens by the device. Right. We would embed our software in something like Microsoft Word and suddenly Microsoft Word would work a lot better. Unless the user had set some crazy setting on the device driver, in which case our system may not work at all. It might make life actually worse for you. We have partially predicted this because we, we uh, the initial studies we did looked at uh, calibration. So that's the mapping from what the device reports, it's actually the device driver reports, to what the user can do. So the user needs to spin the wheel for a little bit. So we partially accounted for it, but not fully accounted for it. The question is very, very astute. It's quite complicated. But what you said, you actually are not changing the device driver. But We're not changing the, the device end, driver. In the application. So, sorry, I'm taking over. Yeah. <laughs> 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 yeah. um, uh, so what was I about to say? <laughs> Philip would have done better. Um, our, our technique is dependent on the length of the document. It's actually more than that. It's dependent on the proportion of the document that's visible. So if you have a one-page document that you then zoom a thousand times so you can only see one pixel, you've still got a thousand pages you need to move through to get from the start to the end. Um, the device driver is part of the, it's at an operating system level. It does not know and it cannot know how long the document is. So only the software, the application, can know that information unless the operating systems get changed in the way they're written and the operating system now coexists with, a, with the applications in a much more uh, close relationship than they currently do. So this is an application level method of game. And it is realistic that they do this because techniques like uh, Firefox now has configuration, uh, sorry, web, web browser like Firefox, have configuration options for how the scrolling works. So does Adobe PDF. So people, the, the, the People delivering the software are gradually moving away from these device drivers, which are just hopeless, to wanting tailored and configured levels of performance for that application itself. So it's realistic. Yeah, that's what we said. Dr. Marmix, and I probably won't um, um, hold your speaking very well because I'm just starting discussing the concept. So I'm all for speed and efficiency. Um, but I'm also aware that some people are just text writers, copy, there are others that are thinking very hard as they're writing. And I just don't know these type of approaches, does it enhance thinking or does it reduce thinking? The quality of the final outcome, is it better or worse because you're speeding things up? Give it a go on the night. <laughs> Sometimes you need the time break to have the micro think in order to improve the quality of what you write. Yeah, that's true. So when you're when you're doing stuff, you're, you're kind of um, you've got like, multiple channels going in your mind. I guess when you're like automatically doing this stuff and thinking more deeply about something else. Um, we haven't really looked into it, to be honest. Um, so yeah. Okay, here's my answer. Uh, <laughs> I think it's it's a really great question. What do you care about when you're writing a document? I th I honestly think the answer is you care about the document, the workspace you're working with. Um, as, we move, as we've shifted from menus, uh, which are by default invisible except for a menu bar, to uh, omnipresent taskbars at the bottom that are now pretty fat and chunky, uh, to ribbons that are really fat and chunky, what's happening is our precious information space uh, for working with the document is being consumed. If you buy a netbook, 
uh, your, your screen real estate is really crushed. Uh, its vertical space is very, very low. And you actually calculate that up. you lose 30% of your screen real estate uh, to the controls if you're using a network. If you go to command maps, you lose 0% of your uh, screen real estate. So I think it would help you concentrate on the, on the document. Um, you hear a lot of people complain um, with the, uh, the new Windows, the new Word, uh, I'm confused, you know. Has, has there been any studies, I presume Microsoft have, you know, studied how more efficient it is with the new ribbons as opposed to the menu driven one. And, uh, I mean, does this, um, is it better, is it faster? Um, well, I can show you that graph. <laughs> So, uh, if you assume you know you've got fifty percent of the controls in the right in the current tab, then it is slightly faster. I haven't actually seen any of Microsoft's research on this. Do you know if they publish it or it's all internal? There's an excellent blog that was put out in Office 2007 that's been developed by uh, his last name is Jensen, I think. Uh, it's not a place for thinking of it. It's important to bear in mind though that Microsoft are trying to satisfy a lot more than just performance. Yeah. They are wanting, you know, that emotional bond with your software. I honestly I think the ribbon is better for that. I think its its visual appearance is much more beautifully crafted than those clunky old menus. And that uh, at what point does Microsoft's concern for your satisfaction diminish? I, I don't know. Maybe they you know obviously they're keen on selling. Uh, so you'll look at that in the, in the shop and go, that's great. Performance, I don't think there's a big difference here. In certain situations, it is better. We know that. Uh, we can do better still. So as increasingly these types of applications are moving to the cloud, are we going to see some of the functionality? Are we going to be back to the clumsy kind of menu of the face of the Like Google Docs and things versus um, from what I've seen, web interfaces by Google Docs tend to be modeled on the same, you know, like modeled on the desktop interfaces that have been standard for ages anyway. Like Google Docs has menus and toolbars. Mm. Um, I don't know if it's going to affect the interfaces at all. Kind of more affects the back end of user. With your command, Mac, um, yeah. how do you choose between I'm uh, clicking a command and I'm wanting to go to this point in the document? Oh, uh, you hold down control. So you, you hold down control with damn. <laughs> <laughs> okay. okay, you hold down control and then it appears. Uh, it does a little bit faster than that. And then you release control and it goes away. Okay. So it's just while you're holding down control, you can click on those. And it could be a mouse button. It could be a variety of ways. Um, we still seem to be very much in that kind of a uh, physical, <coughs> tactile sort of interface. You know, voice activation came out how many years ago? It was deemed to be the kind of cure-all for uh, RSI and ooze and all those other kind of issues. Where is that at? Uh, because it seems to have just died away. They, they talk to my computer, I say, no, page layout of this margins. Is it? Yeah, I wonder if that any more efficient. Yeah, I'll give you one answer. Um, I, yeah, I, I have made a couple of these problems maybe 10, 12 years ago and, and got hold of um, some software for that. And uh, I ended up with a sore voice at the end of the day. <laughs> <laughs> you try talking for eight hours a day. Um, so again, and I mean, it's sort of one of the things I'm noticing from these guys is every time something that looks cool gets invented. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, do you want to no, Tim, Tim finish? Yeah, every time you see something cool, 
they have to check it in the lab because quite often it turns out it is very cool, but it actually then hurts you in some other way. Yeah. So here's a relevant video. Some of you may have seen this before. Kinds of messages you might expect. Business is good. Reiterating guidance. What Microsoft plans to do to take on Google. Then there was the live product demonstration gone wrong. Microsoft calls it voice recognition, but after today's major technical glitch, you and I might want to refer to it as voice recognition. <laughs> Dear mom, comma. <laughs> Fix it. <laughs> Delete that. Delete that. I think it's picking up a little bit of echo here. Delete. Select all. Perceive it. It takes you time to go. Uh, 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 oh yeah, that's the one, right? You've got to read that information. You've got to process it. You then need to make a decision about what you're going to do. All of those operations, although this is quick, every single one of those takes time. Instead, what we have is the tool that you want is right there, right? You know where it is. It's always in the same place, uh, and you you make the decision to acquire it. And as you're making the decision to it, you're moving your cursor to it. So although you may need to move a larger distance, that movement is something we're fantastically good at. So, right? uh, so, so the decision is a lot faster. A human cognitive <coughs> decision is a lot faster than a visual search process. Uh, uh, uh. So as soon as you need the user to respond to the system state, you're consuming so much time, you would have been better off allowing them to simply decide about the location of the object. It's good argument. 
als Es ist gut, dass du findest. Ich bin sehr glücklich, dass diese Diskussion hier ist. This is the kind of discussion you want the students to be having. Um, there are no right and wrong answers in this area, right? It's, it's just because you're dealing with humans. There are, there are thousands of wrong answers. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, but the main thing is, of course, to open up students' minds to the fact that just because you give it a mouse doesn't mean that that's the interface you know, you're stuck with. Maybe there are people who actually work on improving what the, the user experience. Hey, I'd just like to thank these guys for taking the time to do that. <laughs> Oh, I did have one quick question. Um, so I, I thought I'd just ask Joey and Philip, like, what school did you go to and what path did you take to get here? Yeah. Just, just in, in, a, in a word, like, how did you get into computer science? Um, so I went to Rickon High School. Does anybody here Rickon? I don't recognize anybody. So. <laughs> um, I went to Rickon High School. I went to Rickon High School. And yeah, I just did some math and some science. Um, did a lot of programming at lunchtime. <laughs> Samples over the next couple of days. <laughs> okay, thanks again.